Good. Well, hello. Good afternoon. I feel like I'm not going to have as many questions as the regulatory section did, so uh, I'll try to make it interesting. Um, I'm Jessica Ostromek. I am with CBRE, um, and I'm pleased to be here to talk with you all. It's very rare that we get to explore the impacts of a new industry that just kind of poofs out of nowhere. And so I think from a research standpoint, um, it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity. I wanted to talk to you for just a minute about my company because um, I think it'll help sort of understand our perspective um, and the approach we took to uh, the research I'm going to present today. Um, CBRE is a full service commercial real estate company. We represent landlords, we represent tenants, um, investors all around the world for commercial transactions. So industrial, office, retail, apartments, those types of things. Um, we are also a public company. We are a public company with a lot of federal contracts. And so when this issue came to be and we were looking at square in the eye saying we've got to sort of figure this out from a thought leadership perspective, um, we had a lot of consensus building or support building that we needed to do within our organization. Um, I'm really proud that they let us go down the path and publish a piece of work because um, I got to tell you, there's people in other parts of the country that are not facing this head on and it feels far away to them, at least it did a few years ago, um, and they really just didn't want to tackle it. There's a lot of risk associated with it um, if you're a federal contractor, that type of thing. Um, but we're a thought leader, too, and so, um, you know, that's why they let us tackle it. With sort of the caveat that when CBRE um, engages in this industry, it's mostly from a landlord representation standpoint. So most of the work that we're doing on this side in Colorado is with the landlords. It's with the people that own the industrial buildings or own the retail buildings where the grow operations or the dispensaries are housed. Um, so it's not so much from a tenant side. So that's the part I can't really talk to you as much about. I'll be able to talk more from a building owner um, and a landlord side. Just want to make that distinction. Um, but ultimately, um, about a year ago, we engaged in this big study. Um, it mostly focused on Denver because that's where we were most able to get um, licenses information, and that's also where our brokers are active, and so we could rely on them to, to make sure we knew what was going on in a building and if that was indeed a grow house or sort of what the activity was that was taking or was going on under, underneath the roof. So this study, as I say, is mostly Denver-focused. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say quickly about the methodology is that we had to be resourceful or creative because as, um, um, as the woman I just uh, followed was saying, the regulations are getting much better. They're getting much more robust. But even two years ago, three years ago, it really was difficult to get a good handle on how many grow operations there were, what size they were, all that type of information. So I'm going to say that this is um, resourceful research. I, I stand by it 100%, but it's not 100% accurate because the data just isn't 100% there. Oh, and then also, um, I'm a real estate person, so I tend to jump into real estate jargon very quickly, and I know that people don't always talk in those terms. So if I say something that's not a common word to you and you're not quite sure of the meaning, we just throw your hand up and I'll offer a quick uh, definition if I forget. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, the impact to commercial real estate on industrial real estate, big warehouses, that type of thing, and then retail um, being stores. So we're going to start off with industrial first. I think it's really helpful to talk about the timeline um, on the road to recreational marijuana, as I've got up there, because it, it really um, brings out the impact in commercial real estate, I think, even more. So what I've got up on top is a timeline that you guys are probably pretty familiar with. Um, but the chart below it is measuring absorption. And that's basically the change in occupied square feet. This is our demand um, metric for the most part. And this is looking at B and C warehouses. So this is not the top of the line product that's being built out by the airport. These are older warehouses that were built in the 50s or 60s. 
Um, they don't have good access. They don't have good visibility. Their ceiling heights are not 30 foot clear. They're more like 26 clear or even 18 clear. So they're not top of the line product. And this is also looking at demand in central markets. So in Denver, it's kind of 6th Avenue to the south, up to maybe 60th on the north, kind of following I-25, but also out east on I-70. And what you can see is that even though we were in a recession, 2008 and 2009, you see negative absorption, negative demand, people leaving space. You see marijuana coming online, and all of a sudden, we, get pop, we pop up with positive absorption in this particular category. If you look at the overall industrial market, you don't see it because you have a big Class A warehouse out by DIA that, you know, this, this just doesn't work. It's not a grow house type of facility, so it remained vacant. You also see in the line chart, kind of on the right axis, that's vacancy. Vacancy tanked. The market tightened up really, really quickly during this time, and a lot of it had to do with, with marijuana. In fact, 35% of absorption over this period, that five-year period, we attribute to marijuana, which is a huge, it's a staggering percentage. I mean, it's mouth-dropping for me to be able to say that, but I really have to caveat it with the reason it had such a big impact on commercial real estate at this point is because we were in a recession, and there really wasn't demand from other products or industries as there typically were. Does this surprise you guys, Does that percentage? Over a third of demand over that period? It surprised me. So um, it came out to about 3.7 million square feet that we could attribute uh, to grow houses in Denver. And when you talk to brokers, um, you know, some would say, oh, it's a million square feet, gut estimate. Others would say five to six million square feet, which is really why we set out to do this study, because we felt like it was important to not overstate the impact, but also to really have a clear understanding of how it fits in our, in our puzzle piece, or in our puzzle. So we were ended, ended up getting to 3.7 million square feet of grow houses in Denver. You can see that they are really tracking along I-25 and I-70. Those are the historic industrial neighborhoods within Denver. So that's where that empty, vacant Class B and C product was, just sitting available, um, ready to be taken over. But that's also where zoning allowed grow houses to be. Right? So zoning really dictates from a retail, but also an industrial standpoint, where they can be. And I and B industrial zoning was, is, really, uh, is really their spot. This is kind of some of the key numbers that I think, is, that I think are uh, pretty interesting. Up there at the top, you see the 3.7 million square foot footprint. That probably... If we assume that's the accurate footprint, which I know it's not, but that's our best estimate, probably has shrunk a bit since then because there's been some consolidation among the growers that we're aware of. But it's, it's probably pretty darn close because as, um, as we've sort of talked about, there's been some new folks coming into the market too. So it was 35% of demand, but what does it come out to be in terms of the entire industry? It's only 2.6% of our warehouse market. That's a, that's a small percentage. And if you look at the 3.7% as a total of our entire industrial market, it's only 1.5%. But here's another sort of relative metric. Right now, under construction right now is 3.7 million square feet, or 3.5 million square feet of industrial product. And that actually represents pretty darn close to the footprint of grow houses in Denver. So depends on where you're coming from. I think it's a pretty big footprint. I think it's notable to the industry. Um, I can even equate, on some levels, the e-commerce footprint that we're going to have in a couple years to the grow house footprint. So 2.6% sounds like a small percentage, and it really is, but it's still important to the industry. Lease rates, it's um, I think fourth from the bottom there. Lease rates are what tenants pay to 
to, to rent the space. And back in 2013, 2014, 2010 even for medical, we were seeing lease rates for grow, help, grow operations come in at two to three times the average rate. It's a huge deal. Industrial lease rates typically plot along at like $5 a, per, a square foot, sort of historically forever. And to have that sort of a jump in asking lease rates was astounding to real estate professionals. Um, the reasoning behind that high lease rate is that building owners, landlords, had to take a risk to let these tenants come into their space. Um, back when this was new on the scene, people were worried that there'd be um, damage to properties if the product was stolen. Um, people, landlords were worried that if the federal government came in to seize assets, being the plants, they would also take elements of the building or even the property. Um, so that was sort of partly why lease rates were so expensive. It was also very tough for building owners to retrofit existing product to accommodate grow houses. They are heavy power users from a HVAC and a lighting standpoint. And so they needed Excel Energy to come out and really provide a lot more amps than they typically would. So, you know, I think the, the two to three times the average warehouse rent, that's pulled back, definitely. Um, now it's maybe not quite even double, um, but they're definitely higher than average rental rates that landlords are able to achieve when they have grow ops in their, in, in their warehouses. We also, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, work with investors who buy and sell buildings. And there's been a lot of interest from property investors outside of Colorado and domestically within the state to purchase these facilities. They think they'll be good investments in the long run. So what we've tracked over time is the sale price per square foot of known grow houses. And if I took the outlier out on top, which I probably should have, but it, it's legit, you see an upward trend from about $40 to $50 per square foot in building sale value, all the way up to 90 and, and close to 100. So indeed, um, you've seen uh, certainly upward pressure there on price per square foot from the investment side. So what does all this mean? We had a recession. Marijuana grow ops came on the market and helped our fundamentals tighten quite a bit. We had lease rates increase, we had vacancy decrease, absorption was really strong. Has that been the only thing to hold up our industrial market? Absolutely not. I want to show you just a couple more statistics about the overall industrial market and talk to you about where we are now and how marijuana kind of fits into the picture now. Um, this is another kind of fundamental chart. You've got vacancy in the green vertical bars. The blue line is the historic vacancy average. And then you've got lease rates in the um, bright green line. Vacancy dropped 380 basis points between 2010 and 2015. And a good part of that was marijuana. But we don't think the leasing activity for marijuana was so strong in the warehouse district past 2014. So really, you had a shift. You had the grow up leasing kind of taper off, and you had some other industries really come into the market to make it a very tight, very healthy commercial real estate market for industrial. There's two sub-markets that I have. And we talk about real estate for Denver in general, but then we divide all the markets up into sub-markets so we can really kind of understand the dynamics that are going on at a more local level. And I mentioned that grow houses were really active in the central submarkets. So there I've got circled the central and the north central submarkets. And I want you to look at those vacancy rates 1.2% and 2.4%. That is just about as tight as it can be. If you want 20,000 square feet in any of those submarkets, you're really not going to be able to find it. And, and that's really where I think you can see the impact of grow houses in industrial. Those are the tight markets. And those are also the markets that are in such hot demand by non-medical industries. 
people that distribute food or um, plumbing supply or construction type folks, they want to be in central markets too, um, and they just can't because that's where um, the grow-ups are really concentrated. I think this is my last slide on industrial, and what I'm showing you is a comparison of demand just after the recession and then demand in the last couple years. Marijuana, 35%, we think of absorption over that five-year period. And I mentioned that's tapered off. That's really been taken over by transportation and logistics, third-party logistics delivery services. Um, food and beverage is a huge source of industrial demand right now. Um, the other category is where you still see some grow ops popping up, along with a gazillion other different things. It's still there. Um, but I just want to make the point that you know, population growth, um, which is why we're all sort of here, e-commerce, um, those types of things, that's really what's boosted and continued to tighten the industrial market. We just had a big kickstart from, from grow houses post the recession. Any questions on industrial before we move on to retail? I knew it wasn't going to be as exciting. <laughs> If you're from Pueblo, that may happen. You don't know. There are a lot of outdoor grows, and the majority of those are in Pueblo. They still have the same requirements, though, video surveillance and RFID tags. I had a question about the industrial <coughs> yes. in particular, because we're also I'm also seeing some in those central corridors where you're taking industrial offline to become they're leveling things for housing, mm -hmm. in particular along the plat. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing that, or was that in, taken into account, I guess would be the question? Into the fundamentals? Right. Yeah. Yeah, the question goes, it's a great question, um, and it's a hot topic, and it goes to sort of the, the industrial base that's changing within Denver. Everybody's very familiar probably with River North. That was a historical industrial neighborhood that probably in five years will have maybe one or two industrial users left. Um, the National Western Stock Show is another area where you have a lot of industrial users that are getting pushed out because of the um, condemnation and the renovation that's happening with that project. And then along the South Platte, there are some scrape sites and infill sites that will be transitioned into non-industrial uses. Um, I think that is factoring into lease rate growth, actually, because when you build a new industrial building, that replacement cost is going to be a lot higher um, than it was when that 1970s or 80s building was built. Um, so we are seeing lease rates in the central district for new construction upwards of $8, which is absolutely a record high for our market. So that is kind of playing into the dy dynamics as an um, but more so for smaller users. So those tend to be five to 10 to 20,000 square foot users that are getting pushed out of the, the historic areas and, and moved into new facilities. And then I guess, could I follow that up? I just sure. have one other question. We're seeing some where they're coming back online in terms of being open on the market. <clears throat> they're clearly used to be grow houses, mm -hmm. like with all of the security cameras and all of that stuff. Are you seeing a lot of costs for your landlords to then go back? Because the rental rates they're asking appear not to be related. I mean, like you said, two times, you can see it pretty easily. They seem to be going back to more traditional rental rates. Are, are you seeing that showing up in your research as well? I am. It's, it's not consistent. It's pretty varied. Some landlords just kind of throw their hands up with it because these tenants are um, you know, in the real estate world, the nice way that we say it is non-credit tenants. They're tenants that don't have a long business history. Their financial solvency is not maybe um, what you'd like it to be. Some tenants in this business, grow tenants, will lease for two to three years, which is a much shorter lease time than what landlords typically like to see. They like to see a minimum of five, upwards to ten or more. Um, so if you have a grow op that 
goes bankrupt and you're left holding the bag or you're tired of tenant turnover or maybe you have an, a co-investor that comes into your business that doesn't want to have the risk associated with this type of tenant, um, sure, we're absolutely seeing some landlords move away from it. But frankly, the financial benefit that they receive from having a grow up within their facility is pretty powerful for most of them, pretty convincing. Um, I did want to mention a little bit about grow houses, or greenhouses, which I appreciate you bringing up. That is a risk to the industrial demand um, for grow houses that we've seen. It's so expensive to power these buildings, um, the lighting, the HVAC, and so there is a lot of discussion that we hear about grow house or greenhouses happening you know, outside of the Denver metro. You'd have to transfer via truck and delivery the product back into the population center, um, but there's a lot of people that I think are exploring that option. Just a follow-up question. You had stated that a lot of the landlords are actually paying for all of that new infrastructure, the water, the electric, the, and is that pretty typical? What percentage would you put that the landlord actually pays for it, or is it the tenant paying for it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the landlord is going to pay for building upgrades to the building that um, are, you know, power in nature typically, um, amps, HVAC systems. But what we call a tenant improvement is the cost um, to sort of complete the facility and outfit the facility to function as the tenant needs it to. And so a lot of those tenant improvement costs will be shared typically in a typical industrial lease. What we see a lot, though, is beyond power and beyond some of the basics, landlords are not going to provide extra cash out of their pocket to help the tenant get up and running because these tenants are risky. Um, you know, when you're comparing a Kraft Foods to a grow op that's been up and running for a year or two, there's just no way to avoid the risk. Um, and so they're not willing to outlay any more cash. In fact, they like the tenant to put the tenant improvements in themselves so that they're more committed to that lease and to remaining um, a tenant, a viable tenant in the building. Make sense? Sure. Okay, a couple words on retail. Um, retail was initially impacted quite a bit with medical marijuana, and that was certainly the first one to come out of the gate before recreational. Again, this happened in the recession when we had a lot of quote-unquote dark strip center retail. Um, I'm showing an example here. Dark just means vacant to us. They were mostly attracted to inline strip center product, certainly not in lifestyle centers or in malls. That just really wasn't the right solution for a lot of the dispensaries. Um, and it was a great compliment. It really helped boost, um, boost the industry and boost absorption from that standpoint. In Denver, we were able to count 214 retail licenses, and I'm sure that that's changed over the past year. Um, but to put that in perspective, um, there were five times more retail dispensaries than there were non-grocery anchored Starbucks. There's my retail or my real estate jargon, but the Starbucks that's in your grocery store, we don't count that. But there were five times more retail dispensaries than regular unattached Starbucks in Denver at this time, which is staggering. If you notice the um, dispersion of locations, you can kind of compare that to the industrial layout. Um, there are zoning restrictions, certainly for retail. I, I believe it's still 1,000 square feet from uh, schools and homes. Um, but you'll see much more dispersion of facilities than the, the pattern that industrial grow houses followed. Um, another kind of by the numbers slide. We were able to get to about 40, 430,000 square feet of retail uh, within the Denver Metro. We thought, um, and again, this is a little bit of an estimate, but I, I feel good saying it. It was about 2.8% of the retail um, market in Denver, and that's a very similar sort of relationship to grow houses, which I think is a pretty interesting trend. Most of them are around 2,000 square feet, a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. 
Um, and the other similarity to, similarity to industrial is that they tended to go in what we consider B and C retail space too. Um, I don't think it's shocking to anybody that they didn't go for the premium spaces, even though they may have been available because the market was so soft. Um, but this is really where they felt um, they were going to reach their clientele, um, what they could afford as a new business, that type of thing. And the lease rate premium that retail dispensaries paid was not nearly as high as what grow ops paid, that two to three differential. Um, but we think it was maybe 50% more than average um, because there still was a risk element associated to retail. But I'll tell you that retail landlords are much more comfortable leasing to a non-credit tenant because in the retail world, that's mom and pop stuff. That's you know, Sally, who's got a boutique that she wants to open. And so they're a little bit more comfortable not having such proven revenue streams um, than industrial folks were. On the retail side, I just kind of wanted to show our fundamentals and, and how this came into play historically. You see um, vacancy, you know, not really being as affected by grow ops as industrial was. Industrial was so clear that, that industrial vacancy rates started to tank. Retail really struggled because retail is going through, I don't know, midlife crisis or something. Um, with e-commerce coming on so strong, retailers are really struggling. That product is not flexible and it's not as accommodative to changing trends. Um, and so there's a lot of retailers that are struggling. Um, there's also dying big boxes. I mean, you read in the news about Sports Authority and a handful of other people that are really struggling. So retail's got kind of its own set of problems. It's not as clear the impact of marijuana on retail as is industrial. What's great though about retail is that we've had incredible population growth, as this group knows more than anyone, and that has drawn retailers into the Denver market. Um, we've had so many new restaurants, um, um, clothing stores, furniture stores, all those types of things that have really been drawn to the demographic story in Colorado, and that's what's really started to boost retail fundamentals, not, not marijuana. Again, I mentioned that we just really did this study on Denver because that was the information that was as readily available um, as we could find, but certainly there is impact um, in Pueblo. We've been able to see in a little bit in northern Colorado as well. Um, but the study that we did that I presented today was really one of a kind. We had calls from, you know, in the real estate world, a lot of different investors and magazines and newspapers really wanting to understand what the impact was. And um, I, I just, I think it's great that Denver's been a good experiment, that we've been able to kind of tell the story, but going forward, we are not gonna be the experiment any longer. I mean, that map is really starting to get green. No pun intended. <laughs> Um, that's all I have, and I think I'm about out of time. So thank you so much. Jessica, you can take about oh, two, okay. two or three questions if anybody's got them. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah, so the conclusion of the crowding out effects, what I'm hearing is retail, there's almost very little crowding out just because retail is struggling. Mm -hmm. And then in the warehouse space, because this is B and C, the crowding out isn't of other warehouse uses. It's other perhaps mixed uses with residential coming into formerly industrial areas. Is that a summary? That's a summary with a caveat. I, the, the retail side is absolutely correct from my vantage point. There's right. very little crowding out of other retail outfits because of dispensaries. On the industrial side, there is some crowding out in the central markets. And, and, and the gentleman over here brought up the point about the base changing and about a lot of industrial being scraped and redeveloped into some things, and that is happening. It's more of a parallel effect than one or the other. They're both crowding out industrial occupiers. Those industrial occupiers are having to look elsewhere, farther north, farther south, farther east to find their facility, and they're certainly having to pay more for it than they would have if they renewed their lease 10 years ago. And reading between the lines, we should fear Amazon Prime more than weed? <laughs> <laughs> or when Amazon Prime delivers weed, it'll be like oh a God. convergence? 
I'll sit down. Okay. No comment. <laughs>